Uh, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Chip Gibbons. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I helped to run the Metro DC Socialist Night School with David Kibe, who is not here tonight. Uh, this is the Socialist Night School on Police, Police Unions and Racial Capitalism. I believe it was co-organized with our Defund the Police, our chapter Defund the Police working group. And we have three presenters tonight. Uh, we have Ola Femi Taiwo, an assistant professor of philosophy at Georgetown University and a DSA member. Uh, Stuart Schrader, the associate director of the program in racism, immigration, and citizenship, and a lecturer at John Hopkins University. And Nell Geyser, a member of the Metro DC DSA Defund NPD Working Group. I'm going to let the three of you take it away from here. Um, and after the presentations, we'll have questions. I will ask you to put your questions in the chat box so I can read them to the presenters. And if you're not presenting, could you please mute yourself? So someone has something in their background. Uh, who's who's starting? Who's, are you going first? Yep. Yeah. Let me uh, see if I can share my screen. Um, what's up, comrades? Uh, good to be here. Uh, I'm Femi. I'm uh, in. Obviously, I'm in uh, academia, but uh, also in DSA um, and worked on. Uh, Defund MPD. Um, and I'm going to mostly talk about racial capitalism because I think, um, though it obviously connects to the other things we're talking about, police and police unions, um, Stuart and Nell are going to do um, a better job focusing there than me. So I'll focus on this for today. Um, and I basically just want to explain what this view is because I think it's. Um, really often misunderstood view. I think people often talk past each other when they talk about this. So um, in my 15 minutes, I'll just explain what I take this view to be. So the basic um, idea, I think is well dramatized by this moment from f 5 million years ago, which is apparently last election cycle. Um, if you remember this, Hillary Clinton asked, you know, if we broke up the big banks tomorrow, would that end racism? Um, and in one sense, that was a kind of perplexing thing to say. It was obviously a good political strategy because it's not clear what racism has to do with things like big banks. Um, but on the view of racial capitalism, they have quite a bit to do with each other. Um, and so that's a good way to say what's at stake um, understanding the relationship between um, all the aspects of uh, our social structure in the way that racial capitalism does. And the way that racial capitalism does, I think the name is a little um, misleading or befuddling. Um, if you take nothing else from Dave, if you don't hear anything else that I say, just understand this. Racial capitalism is the name of a theory, right? Um, people often respond to it as though it's just, you know, the phrase itself, um, race plus capitalism. Um, I don't think that's the right way to understand what the view is. I think you should think of racial capitalism as a name for a much longer description of our social reality and our world history. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over the history of racial capitalism, basic ideas, um, arguments about it, and then um, I'll hand the mic off to uh, comrades Stuart and Mel. So history. Starting off with the term, right? Um, the term as developed by some of the people who theorize about racial capitalism, not all of them, but the tradition that I fall into um, is what some people call world systems theory of politics. So just thinking about politics at a global scale. And that started outside of the academy 
um, figures like Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Vladimir Lenin um, were doing that. Um, the term racial capitalism was first used by South African intellectuals who were analyzing their um, economic and social structure of apartheid in South Africa. Also people in um, the Dar es Salaam school of um, people who are East Africans. Um, so comes from African Marxist theory, broadly construed. Um, it was popularized in the US by the book Black Marxism, which picked up on this African Marxist theory um, and applied it to something that had been developed by a Trinidadian thinker, Oliver Cox, um, which was which became world systems thinking, politics on a global scale. So that's where the term comes from. But what racial capitalism is, in part, is a way of telling world history. Um, so one of the things it answers is, how is it that European powers got so influential, got so powerful? Um, on this way of telling history, it is the result of stuff that happened starting from 1492 to present. It's not something that they came in with. What they did come in with was a way of organizing society. Right. And so I think this is the kind of crucial philosophical claim of racial capitalism. The thing we're trying to understand isn't just how production works, but it's how the whole social system works. And that's maybe the difference between um, racial capitalism and other ways of thinking about capitalism or other materialist ways of thinking about world history. Um, so um, on the racial capitalist view, you're trying to understand how the entire social structure is maintained. Um, and the history of that. So Cedric Robinson in particular is um, careful to say the kind of categorization of people into vertically organized um, inheritable levels of humanity is actually quite old. It's much older than the racial empire that resulted from 1492. You can see it in Greek thought so on and so forth um, in the treatment of the Irish and the treatment of the Slavs. Um, that idea has been around for a while. Um, what's new about racial capitalism is essentially the scale of it and the colonial conquest of the world. So to put that, to relate that to other ways of thinking about capitalism, to thinking about maybe the profit motive as kind of a motive forced of history um, you could say something like this, the plantation, the mines, the encomienda that um, Spanish empire set up um, around indigenous labor after um, conquering parts of the Americas in 1492. Um, the profits from these things might be why the systems were set up. But if we wanna understand what was set up, we have to tell a much larger, a much holistic story about the social system as a whole. It's a basic idea that uh, I take it most theorists in the racial capitalism uh, tradition of thinking think that social system is racially stratified. So that's the basic history of racial capitalism. So what's the idea of the theories itself, the basic ideas? Um, well, one idea, the development, organization, and expansion of capitalist society um, pursued essentially racial directions, so vertically stratified uh, familial clusters of a population, essentially. Um, ideology also matched, so racialism, as Robinson puts it, permeates the social structures, how we understand the distinctions in our society. Again, our whole society, not just our system of production. Um, that was essentially racial in some sense. Hi, everyone. Um I want to just let you go. I, I, I'm just here to make myself available to you guys um, as far as like having usage help and whatnot. Um, I've been probably one of the main people helping to um, beta test or was one of the first people to start beta testing it. Um, I can answer if you have um, iOS devices, I can answer all your questions about the mobile apps, both on iPad and iPhone. There is also a desktop app for Mac OS if you use um, any kinds of Macs like that. Sorry, I don't. Stephanie, are you meaning to tell the night school this or? Sorry about that. Uh, carry on. 
Okay, um, cool. So um, let's see. So before the basic idea is racialism, racial thinking, racial ideology built into the social structures that result from colonial conquest 1492 to present. Um, these things start with the kinds of motivations that we're more used to thinking about as materialists, as Marxists, as socialists, um, land, profit, and plunder, right? So um, Ted Allen's great book, The Invention of the White Race, something to check out. Um, this kind of racial social structure is something that evolved after the land profit seeking and plunder seeking was already underway, um, but it's a stable systemic result of the kinds of forces at play. So at bottom, what racial capitalism is, is the theory that the spread of capitalism, the colonial conquest proliferated a mode of production. So that's maybe capitalism simpliciter, just basic how is production organized. Um, a form of social organization, um, that would be racial hierarchies, racial stratification, and ideologies, racialism. So how do we understand both of those first things? Um, and I'm putting them more or less in order of importance as I understand it. Um, so the plantation system in the US South, for example, a system of production um, organized around agricultural production like cash crops, like cotton, um, a form of social organization around it. So how do we organize who produces the cotton, who can own things, who has basic rights? It's a slave system and it's racially based in the US and how do we justify that white supremacy? That's the basic way of thinking about the world that we're talking about. It's not a thing that is over and done with. Um, the plantation system is just an example of one way that this kind of society, this kind of social setup can work. So a good general statement of what's going on here is offered by Ruthie Gilmore. Racism is a state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. It's a mouthful, it's a lot of stuff happening there. Um, but I think if we just look at a example, we can see why she's explaining it in that way. So think about something like redlining, right? Um, it's these maps, produced as part of the New Deal by a federal corporation evaluating lending risk of neighborhoods. So essentially saying um, capital should avoid the red places and should go to the green places, the red places disproportionately where black immigrant and or low income people live, white neighborhoods, green. Um, so uh, that was very influential nearly a hundred years later, we still find social effects of this kind of distributive question. And so if we relate this back to what Gilmore is saying, uh, when she says group differentiated vulnerability, we should think roughly races. When she says premature death, we could think roughly material security, food, water, health, shelter, protection, violence, and predation. Um, stratifications, group level differences in material security are produced and they're exploited. Right, they're produced by maps like the ones that we saw in redlining and they're exploited by people like um, banks who uh, lend to different people differentially um, and police and so on and so forth. So to the restate the general view, racial domination of the enslaved and indigenous populations helped secure the entire social order. Um, on which things like plantations, but not just plantations, depended. So that means all the things that secure that, police violence, settler militia, slave patrols, immigrant surveillance, um, all of which are, I think, tightly bound up with policing, that plays a functional role in cementing racial capitalism. It's not some appendage that has nothing directly to do with capital. Violence workers do this thing in the social system, which is core to how it works. They distribute security and insecurity. They say who's at risk and who's not. Um, so organizing and racially distributing violence is part and parcel of the core functional parts of our social system on the view of racial capitalism, right? So deciding who's, who can use land, who can use bodily autonomy, who can use even their rational capacities, 
that has to do with how security and insecurity is distributed, that's distributed racially. So society is made safe for some people at the expense of other people. Race helps organize who is who. So that's the basic idea of what's going on with racial capitalism, or at least one way of explaining what's going on with racial capitalism. Uh, so finally, um, let's talk about why it is that this is a controversial way of thinking about the world, um, answers to objections that people lob at this way of thinking. And almost all of them are of the form, what's the word racial doing? Why did we put racial in front of racial capitalism? One way you could make this objection is you could say, well, to say racial ignores other things. It ignores gender, sexuality, race, national origin, ability, character, intelligence. Um, and I don't think this is right for a variety of reasons. I understand the motivations here, but um, I think the basic assumption is that emphasizing race means that these other categories either don't matter or don't play a causal role. Um, I don't think that's the way we should think about it. I think racial capitalism, the whole story of racial capitalism helps say what all of these things have to do with social structure. Right? And we can tell the story in terms of security, we can tell it in terms of risk, we can tell it in terms of um, broader forms of social organizations, we have some options, but other stuff doesn't become irrelevant because the theory happens to be named racial capitalism. It could have been named, you know, anything else, but what's interesting, what's important is the whole story and not just the name of the story. Um, someone could press further. They could say, well, the problem isn't necessarily just the name, but the fact that we're thinking about something other than profit or extraction of surplus value or the more narrow things that we think are what organizing social life is about. Um, and in particular, we're ignoring the fact that capitalists and the ruling class, they don't care who they oppress, how they oppress, um, they just care that they make more money and have more control, so on and so forth. Um, even if that's right as a psychological description of the ruling class, um, it doesn't mean that their equal willingness to exploit anyone means that everyone is equally risky to exploit or equally profitable to exploit. Um, so Eric Williams, um, the renowned black historian and theorist in the important book, Capitalism and Slavery discusses this quite directly. Um, you know, he says the reason why um, the British empire was more willing to enslave Africans than the Irish who they had been oppressing for quite some time is because they had paid a hefty price in money and blood for the oppression of the Irish who knew where they were living, living, who knew when they were at war with France and could um, help the British Empire's military enemies and did in fact help the British Empire's military enemies. If you enslave people from much further away where there's much less information and political connection, then you can avoid some of those political and military costs, right? So that doesn't have anything to do with the British Empire secretly loving Irish people. It has something to do with them making a calculation about what's in their best interests. So it doesn't presume at all that race is an intrinsic motivation of the elites. That's not how the story goes. Um, but maybe you're not satisfied, right? Maybe you think still something's going on with the word racial and racial capitalism and you don't like it. Um, here's one other version of the question that came up in a um, article written in Dissent by Michael Walzer. Um, who says, well, if we're talking about racial capitalism, we're talking about racial exploitation and racial exploitation isn't a necessary feature of here he says American capitalism, right? So if it's not necessary in some kind of conceptual or metaphysical sense, why are we talking about it? Um, so walter has got some basic things wrong here. Racial capitalism is a world systems theory. There's no coherent sense in which there is an American capitalism, at least on the version of the view developed by Robinson. Um, 
Non-white workers aren't the only ones working in a racially organized systems. There are hierarchies within whiteness, according to most scholars of race over the last few centuries. Um, so we could nitpick with Walzer, but I think the more important thing that he's got wrong is that the, the contribution racism or racial stratification makes is metaphysical necessity, right? That um, what it has to, what has to be true of the world for racial capitalism to work is that racism has to be conceptually baked into capitalism for it to make sense. Um, and I think that basic idea is wrong. Right. Um, and so, as I wrote with um, Liam Covey Bright in a response to Walzer, if we were trying to figure out why a building retains as much heat as it does, we would focus on the actual decisions that had that had been made about the construction of the building. We want to know what it's made of, um, how its parts are arranged, how high the ceilings are, what materials are made out of it, so on and so forth. Um, answering that question about why this building works the way it does in terms of insulation just isn't a question about, you know, a grand metaphysical theory of buildings as such or heat retention. That's just not the kind of question that we're asking. Um, in a similar way, if we're looking at our actual world that has actually had um, European colonial conquests starting from 1490s to present, um, we're trying and we're trying to describe the social dynamics of that world. It isn't relevant um, any sci-fi example that someone could conceivably cook up. That's just not the question we're trying to answer um, as theorists of racial capitalism. We're looking at the world as it actually is and saying uh, we think it works this way rather than this way based on um, some historical observations, based on thinking about economic systems, so on and so forth. So. Walter's just mistaken about the kind of question that racial capitalism is trying to answer. Um, so just to wrap up so I can uh, hand the mic off, um, what's at stake in this question is the kind of thing that defund MPD is doing in DSA. Um, if racism plays a functional role in capitalism and vice versa, then all of these things are not just good things that are, you know, um, helpful to some people, but they are kinds of political campaigns that we should understand as anti-capitalist. So that would include police abolition and community control of police, which is, I think, um, which is the version of abolition that um, I believe in myself. Happy to talk more about that. Um, prison abolition, Medicare for all, federal jobs guarantee, Green New Deal, all these targets or could target, depending on how they're designed, how they shake out, all those could target the kind of group differences in vulnerability um, that is constitutive of racial capitalism. And that helps the whole social system, which includes, but is not reducible to a system of production, um, helps that whole thing survive. Um, and that also helps to say why scholars of racial capitalism like Ruthie Gilmore say things like this. Abolition is about presence, not absence. It's about building life affirming institutions. So the point of thinking about racial capitalism is not um, just thinking about opposition to individual elements of this system, but it's to help understand what we would have to do to make this system into a different and better one. We would, we would have to challenge not just our system of production, but basic elements of how our society is knit together um, over and beyond how we produce goods. Thank you. I believe Stuart is, is next, Stuart. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, sorry, I had some technical difficulties um, getting started, but um, can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, ahead. great. I, I'm not gonna show any slides. Uh, I'm just gonna talk briefly um, with some, some thoughts about police. So um, I think that probably many of you who are on this call today um, would probably adopt something like the, the socialist position on police, which roughly stated is something like police work on behalf of capital 
to protect private property, to prevent social protest or revolution against the capital. Police act as the instrument of the capitalist state um, because they're authorized to use violence legitimately um, to achieve those purposes. I think, you know, I kind of just made this up, but I think, you know, this is basically a, a pretty standard definition. I think there's nothing wrong with it. And um, even if it's incomplete, I think it's a great starting point. And I think that the work you're, you're all doing in this group is, is probably um, in an effort to get everybody, you know, to this starting point. But I think we also, I th would probably all recognize that, of course, the world is complicated um, and we probably need some more finely grained analyses. So, so what I wanna do today is try to help everybody by giving a few um, perhaps additional analytic tools to think about police um, as you work on your campaigns, whether in Washington DC or beyond. So one thing that I would say to start, which is perhaps a weird thing to say as, as somebody who, um, you know, whose day job is, is thinking about the police all the time. Um, I think there's, a, there's actually a risk of inflating the importance of the police. Um, so everything that I want to say maybe needs to have a caveat, which is that when we're thinking about racial capitalism, um, as, as we've started to do tonight, um, we need to think of police power as, as part of what needs to be critiqued in, in a critique of capitalism, racism, patriarchy and other um, forms of domination. We need to think about, of course, how police fit into those forms of domination. Um, and, and I think the, the analysis of racial capitalism both calls for an analysis of police, but also um, suggests that, that there's, there's you know, more to be um, taking into account than only um, this institution we call the police. Um, eliminating the police won't make capitalism disappear, um, but I think also capitalism won't disappear without eliminating the power of police. So police do not, uh, this is maybe my first main point that I would like to get across. Police do not only protect the capitalist social order, they also produce it. Uh, and this is the great insight of, of a scholar named Mark Nucleus, who has a, a book uh, uh, on this topic called A Critical Theory of Police Power. It's apparently just been republished by Verso, came out a, a, a while ago. Um, so Nucleus calls this process um, the fabrication of social order. What does that mean? Well, there's a historical dimension to it about how we got capitalism. And it also has a kind of contemporary dimension about how capitalism sustains itself. The great paradox of police power is under capitalism is that police power represents a direct form of domination. Police act, police as, as individuals act in very intimate, personal, um, tactile and tangible ways to, to, to in, in, their, in their jobs. Um, and yet what is, and, and yet what's so interesting or perhaps even paradoxical is that, um, you know, the, the rule of capital itself is a form of impersonal domination. So we have, we have to kind of think about what is the relationship between this highly personal form of domination and then this um, abstract, and highly complicated um, impersonal form of domination. So Neoclis's answer to this, this seeming paradox is to look back into history and say that the modern police institution came into being, these are his words, to fabricate an order of wage labor and administer the class of poverty thereafter. So what does this mean? He's talking about in the early uh, years, decades of capitalism, the way that the commons were enclosed um, which prevented people from accessing traditional non-market forms of resources um, by enforcing or mandating the sale of people's labor in commodity form. That's what he means by fabricating an order of wage labor, making people dependent on the wage for survival, and then making it impossible for people not to work by you know, begging or by supplementing meager wages by stealing, for example. So that's a historical story. But many of these practices, of course, persist in the present. 
police management of begging, police management of um, petty theft. You know, this is the least glamorous, but the most routine type of work that police do today. And so when we start thinking about these types of practices, um, really non-market, uh, non-wage labor forms of, um, of allowing people to subsist, we start to think about ways that um, crime itself has long been defined in class terms and enforcement or non-enforcement of um, criminal offenses is a class making process. Classes are not static things that just kind of exist um, and have existed forever, but classes are always in the process of being re re made and remade through class struggle and police are at the forefront of uh, making and remaking them, including by fashioning geographic boundaries of where crime can or cannot occur, where certain behaviors are tolerated or not tolerated. And so this leads to a second major point that I'd like to convey, which is that police don't stop crime. At best, police redistribute crime. Now, of course, I think many of us will know that uh, jails and prisons are sites of, of violence, oftentimes great violence, um, both on individual levels and, and on institutional levels. We can think of jails and prisons as places where crime gets redistributed to so that we can all pretend it's no longer occurring. And we can pretend that we live in a you know, safe, crime-free neighborhood um, because the, the crime has been relocated out of sight. But at a more basic level, um, study after study for decades has shown that police spend the vast majority of their time every day on activities other than crime, violent crime or felonies. Um, numbers vary, usually something like 90% of what crimes, of what cops do all day has nothing to do with, with anything that we would characterize as, as violent crime. At best, when violent crime occurs, uh, cops arrive afterwards and, and kind of deal with the aftermath, right? Many individual officers will go long periods, sometimes even years, without encountering a felony crime in progress. Now, a cop sitting you know, in a car on a street corner, passively maybe preventing crime from occurring right in front of them, but you know, for me, it's like if I'm thinking of what would I do if I'm walking down the street and I'm, um, you know, interested in like peeking in somebody's window and you know stealing something that I can see by the windowsill. Um, if I see a cop parked on the corner, of course, I'm just going to go to the next corner um, and look for the open window at the next corner, right? So this is a way that crime gets redistributed um, that is typically narrated in terms of crime prevention. But I think that um, prevention is a bit of a, a misnomer at best. So how does this redistribution then intersect with the racialized geographies of our urban landscapes? I think it's, it's fundamental. Typically, uh, police focus on a few zones. Um, they focus on commercial districts where tourists um, and rich people want to feel safe. Um, they focus on interface zones between um, the kind of more commercial districts and um, areas that have a different race class population. Uh, police enact uh, the kind of dividing lines to keep the right people on the right side and the wrong people on the wrong side of those divides. And then of course, police operate in intensively resource starved and disinvested areas, um, typically race or class homogenous areas, housing projects, for example. Um, picking up on the arguments that Femi made about racial capitalism, race is made through these activities. We can think about those redlining maps that he mentioned. How, how do those effects of redlining endure? Um, how can we understand that after you know, the 1960s when, when formal legal equality was supposed to have been enshrined by Congress, um, how, how does uh, racial inequality persist in the very uh, streetscape that we 
see in, you know, I'm in Baltimore where it's very clear. Um, many of you are in Washington, DC where it's also very, very clear. Um, I think we need to, to, to return to the, this idea that um, one of the ways that this persistence of, of, a, of a racial order on this, the, the cityscape um, is possible is through the work that police do fabricating a social order again. Um, I think we can go even farther and say that um, police actually make racial distinction itself rather than only responding to it. Um, I would say, you know, I would argue in, in line with um, thinkers like who, who Femi mentioned, like uh, Ruthie Gilmore or Cedric Robinson, I would say that race is an effect, not a cause of police actions and institutional configurations of power. To the extent that race becomes meaningful as a social marker of honor or advantage or dishonor or disadvantage uh, of, of purported criminal propensity, um, it's based on prior exposure to disadvantage that has been continuously reproduced as a kind of dividing line through police action. Police respond to what they perceive as prior um, exemplification of disadvantage. And this isn't, of course, to say it's immutable. In fact, it's to say that it's constantly socially and institutionally produced, but it's also being continually refreshed through the work that police are doing day in and day out. So what's the response to all of this? I mean, obviously I've tried to condense, you know, um, what what uh, could could take a lifetime to make sense of, um, and I feel like I'm I'm trying to make sense of on a daily basis in my work. Um, what is the response to this complicated story? We tend to think that you know police are the tip of the sphere, tip of the spear of the racial capitalist social order. They act on behalf of capital, um, and yet you know this this raises challenging questions of where should we put the pressure if that's the case? Do we put the pressure on the police themselves or do we put the pressure on the people or institutions on whose behalf they're, they're acting? It becomes even more complicated again in, in cities like DC or Baltimore um, where the people who kind of populate the government, the elected officials, the power structure are um, if, if they're white, they're largely racially liberal white Democrats. Um, and in, you know, for example, in Baltimore, they're largely African American. Can, can we be so certain that the people who are directing the kind of institutional order um, are, are having police do what they do um, for purposes of enacting racism? Well, of course, on some level, this is true, um, but not on every level. This isn't always uh, uh, an easy explanation to offer. So if there's an absence of very obvious um, racist intention as we kind of go up that, you know, spear from the tip on up, how do we nevertheless make sense of these racist outcomes that we can all perceive um, and have certainly been on many of our minds in 2020 and, and now into 2021? Um, I think that, uh, you know, I can't give you the answer for, for how to, uh, you know, deal with that, that difficult question, but I would suggest that we might um, think of police forces themselves as institutions that are um, not totally monolithic um, and not uh, therefore, uh, that, that therefore might have some weaknesses that could be probed um, in political campaigns. I think we can understand police forces as internally fractured and divided. Um, certainly one thing that came out of January 6th was the degree to which race, racial fractures within the, cap, DC, the Capitol Police Force in DC um, have been deep and persistent and uh, came to the fore in, in, the, in those events. So police are um, not a monolith. But then also perhaps counterintuitively, they also have their own interests and political goals that are being fought over through these kind of internal divisions within police forces. To the extent that police seek particular political outcomes, um, they're often expressing the power or hegemony of particular um, kind of 
factions within police forces. And sometimes those align with some people in a government, and sometimes they align with other people in the government. The history of policing in the United States since, you know, really the end of World War II um, is one of internal contestation, oftentimes between liberal reformers um, or technocrats and more conservative type of uh, often rank and file police officers. Now, generally, the rank and file forces have been extremely successful. And, and I know the next speaker is going to talk about police unions in greater depth. Um, but the liberal technocrats have not always lost. Um, and you can see that these two powers within police on a kind of national scale fighting with each other. If you just look at two major national level documents that have been produced in the past um, five years. First, the Obama Task Force on 21st Century Policing, um, which, is, which is an exquisite example of the kind of liberal ideas about policing within the institution. Um, and second, a report that came out on Bill Barr's last day uh, as Attorney General, which I think was December 22nd, um, when there was a report that came out called the, something like the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice. It didn't really get much news coverage. Um, but that report was an effort to repudiate everything that the Obama task force had said about policing, trying to take the power away from liberal technocrats and put the hands back, put the power back in the hands of police officers on the street, allowing them to use their discretion to rule the streets, right? These are two competing visions. We might wanna oppose both of them. In fact, I would argue that we should oppose both of them, but we need, I think, also to be aware that um, they are not totally the same. And some of these fractures could be used perhaps in an advantageous ways in political campaigns. It's, 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 it's to, you know, in the same way that we might understand, um, you know, the differences between different, uh, you know, elected officials and their constituencies and what they represent, right? Um, we might want to say, get rid of all of the bums, but we also, uh, obviously recommend recognize that they are they have some differences so if i th so i think if we can see police institutions as marked by internal struggles we come to better analyses of how these play out on the street um, i think the way that police forces generally operate is by trying to find an accommodation among these competing forces usually the accommodation comes in the form of a certain type of bribery um, where police rank and file get really great pay and benefits um, and the, the technocrats at the top uh, think that well if they're paid well they're going to be competent right um, there's not always evidence that there's any correlation between the two but the technocrats want competence um, to be reflected in outward signs of crime control, whereas the police officers themselves are really just happy to, you know, cash growing paychecks. Um, but what does this mean? And this, this will be my, my last point. What does this mean um, in terms of, of how policing plays out on the streets um, to go back to this question of fabricating social order, um, fabricating a racial capitalist social order? Um, Take a thing like, like a quota um, or take, take a term that may, some of you may have heard like zero tolerance. Um, many cops don't actually like these. Uh, they want flexibility. They want to be able to do certain, you know, enact certain behaviors in some situations and not in other situations. They don't want to be told by their commanding officers that they have to do X, Y, and Z. Zero tolerance means every time you see an offense, you have to, you know, write a summons or arrest or whatever. Um, they would rather not engage, um, but they would also like to have the flexibility to engage in ways that um, they see fit. And sometimes what ends up happening is that uh, police on the whole will, uh, you know, in a force will refuse uh, quotas or refuse zero tolerance. And the commanders at the top will then empower a few special officers to really um, engage in, in the greatest types of um, 
abuses and, and um, discretionary activities. So an, a report just came out about the Baltimore Police Department from the ACLU, um, and it mentioned basically the most corrupt cop in, in the BPD over, over the past few years, a guy named Wayne Jenkins. He's now in federal prison. Wayne Jenkins had 227 complaints lodged against him in less than two years, um, around basically 10 a month. Of course, many people he abused never filed complaints. So why is he allowed to behave this way? The technocrats at the top of the BPD looked at the numbers of arrests that he was making, the amount of you know, guns and drugs that he was finding in his oftentimes uh, unconstitutional searches. Um, and they said, you know what? We will let this happen uh, because this produces good numbers for us. Um, and it will allow the other cops who are not interested in producing those good numbers to have a little bit of slack, right? So the point is that these internal uh, fractures within the police force mean that it, some behaviors by police become incentivized and others um, are less incentivized, right? To mollify the police who want total freedom, the commanders in, in Baltimore kind of unleashed this monster on the city because he supported their strategy. He supported the numbers game. Um, otherwise, I think he didn't see eye to eye with, with the commanders. And so we can use these types of examples to try to break apart or decompose the factions within police force while police forces while still stepping back and saying, okay, altogether, what are they doing? They are um, working to reproduce these types of boundaries that we see in cities. They're reproducing racial distinctions. They're reproducing class distinctions. Um, and overall, they are re reproduce, producing and reproducing um, racial capitalism. And the point of this analysis, again, just to, to, to close, is that with this type of analysis, we can find hopefully um, pressure points, weak points, points to organize around. Um, in order to have a stronger political strategy to take on the police as the tip of the spear, but then also the whole spear itself. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Stuart and Femi. I'm <clears throat> Nell. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm a member of the defund MPD working group within Metro DC DSA. I work in the labor movement, so what I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, I, I have some idea, some some experience with the labor side of it, but I'm I'm definitely not an expert on policing. Um, <clears throat> so it's been a, a process of um, discovery and learning uh, across our you know working group collaborative as we have built this campaign with the leadership of our coalition allies in the defund MPD coalition. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> and walk through a little bit about police unions. Um, and, you know, we're going to get to the Fraternal Order of Police fight here in DC, a campaign that we're engaged in right now. But <clears throat> before we get into that, we need to step back and look at um, what police unions are and how they fit into the larger carceral lobby. Um, you know, I think part of the, the takeaway of this presentation is going to be that police unions are one part of an oppressive system um, and can't really be looked at by themselves. They have to be looked at in that larger context and our campaigns also have to like address that larger context. Um, and it's useful as we dig into what police unions are about to understand that there is this multi-sided law enforcement lobby made up of prison guards unions, district attorneys associations, sheriffs, police chiefs, and together they have worked very successfully in states and in the federal government to block efforts to change sentencing um, laws to abolish, um, you know, to prevent abolishment of solitary confinement, um, to uh, prevent outlawing of capital punishment, 
um, and the closing of prisons, all of these fights that have been had and that, you know, critical resistance and other um, abolitionists over time and, and, and um, reformers of the criminal legal system have had these fights. It hasn't been a static situation, um, but a lot of them have been blocked um, by the this multifaceted uh, law enforcement lobby who grew up over the years. The um, FOP itself was, was founded um, about 100 years ago, but um, they became consolidated their power and became political kingmakers in the 90s, you know, in a confluence with the um, <clears throat> mass incarceration, um, Zenith and war on crime. And they also set up, you know, these very fictitious victim rights groups that were front organizations supporting um, the agenda of the tough on crime movement. Um, and they also position themselves as the only legitimate experts on crime control um, and speaking, you know, on behalf of the police department. They're often the spokespeople talking about the importance of that on the ground perspective um, that Stuart was, was talking about of, um, of policing the streets. So most of this is drawn from a useful article in, in Jacobin that's linked here. And I'm gonna drop this presentation in the chat in a, in a little bit um, because there's some links in it that, that also plug you into um, taking action. Um, so you can link to all of these sources um, at your leisure. <clears throat> so in terms of the <clears throat> police union, <clears throat> excuse me, landscape in the US, uh, the FOP is the world's largest organization of sworn law enforcement officers, according to its own website, and has more than 350,000 members in 2,100 locals or lodges. Um, in recent decades, and this is more talking about the 70s and 80s, the FOP was deeply invested in resisting affirmative action measures that it viewed as allowing officers who hadn't earned their place, um, in other words, code for officers of color to get in ahead of the white ethnics the union represented. So, you know, you can trace the, the history of um, the fraternal order as a benefit society, a social organization that was very exclusionary and racist itself. Today, there are about um, 800,000 or so police and detectives in the US. And so the FOP represents nearly half of, of those. Um, and the FOP, to be clear, is an independent union. It is not affiliated with the AFL-CIO. Um, by contrast, there, there are a lot of police in the AFL-CIO. The International Union of Police Associations um, is in the AFL and has about 100,000 members. And then other unions, other major unions also represent police, um, AFSCME, AFG, UFCW, CWA, SEIU, IB uh, Teamsters. Um, so this is, you know, a very integrated into the labor movement um, group, but also uh, very uh, active and independent in, in their own interests. And why do we single out police unions and correctional unions as different from other unions? Um, so uh, touchstone in, in this research and in this thinking um, for this presentation is an article by Bill Fletcher Jr., a longtime labor um, movement leader and, and, uh, and thinker. He wrote in, in these times earlier this summer, um, an article that helps crystallize all of this and, and pointed out that, you know, fundamentally police uh, officers' interests are aligned with the capitalist colonialist state and that their role is to uphold the interests of property and wealth. And I think we've really gotten a good handle on that from the previous discussions. Um, and so, you know, just also thinking about their uh, job security and self-interest, they, they uh, do have that um, built-in desire to maintain funding and staffing um, as do corrections officers with prison funding. Um, and so, you know, they're different from other unions in that they have a purpose of, um, of protecting property and, and, ex and enacting violence, right? Other public sector and private sector unions, that is, that is not what they're about. Um, and 
However, there, there is a parallel in terms of the values um, that you could look to the building trades unions that sometimes support uh, oil and gas extraction, pipeline construction, uh, because it, again, it's in their self-interest uh, to maintain their jobs. And these are the, that, that also is a violent system that disproportionately harms people of color. So this is not a, a value neutral kind of question of every union should represent its members' interests. There, there has to be a question about what those interests are. Again, though, this is a multi-layered um, carceral system and police unions are, are one layer in that that are that are often used as kind of a smokescreen for a lot of other layers of what's going on here. Um, they do offer a lot of protection from oversight and discipline. Um, the collective bargaining agreements that police unions have negotiated um, often establish multiple levels of appeal beyond conventional union due process and a lot of discretion. Um, elected leaders defer to police department leaders um, and, and claim they can't do a lot because of the collective bargaining agreements. But then there's also all these other ways that the criminal legal system is set up to protect police. Um, many states have law enforcement um, or police officer bill of rights. Um, there's the um, reality of, of our qualified immunity regime, which means that police officers cannot be individually sued. Um, and then district attorneys, you know, who collaborate on a day-to-day -day basis with police also handle cases of police misconduct. This has been addressed with reforms in some states um, and, and localities. The Supreme Court um, in 1989 just established, you know, this horrible standard that Basically, if an officer is scared for their safety, that's the final word. They will be trusted. Um, and that has you know, been one of the driving forces behind uh, police officers almost never being convicted for, for killing um, people. Um, so you know, then there's uh, protection from oversight that's built into some CBAs, but also um, there's laws like in New York Law 50A, which was um, thankfully repealed this year, but it barred disclosure of disciplinary records. So you can't even know how many of, of complaints were filed against an officer like the one in Baltimore. Um, and then protection from defunding is also definitely a function of collective bargaining agreements that lock in wage increases and um, set overtime thresholds and, you know, um, advocate for increased staffing levels um, in some cases. So one among many obstacles to accountability. And they certainly contribute to deadly injustice. This is um, a statement from Sharon Block, who is at Harvard, but she was a member of the National Labor Relations Board under Obama. And uh, she said, you know, that in terms of a real difference from public sector unions and other unions generally, the police um, abuse collective bargaining power um, leaving, you know, and, and people end up dead because of that abuse. And, and that's happening at a significant rate. And it's very different from uh, how other unions exercise their collective bargaining power to protect the interests of working people. Um, so, you know, back to the main point that police unions, however, are not the core of the problem. So Bill Fletcher wrote, the law enforcement unions are not the problem, the history, culture, and practices of the US law enforcement system are the problem. And when officials claim that there's little they can do about police contracts, this is nothing but sophistry. Police departments can be reorganized. The government might have to negotiate the impact on those officers and workers, but it has the power to radically restructure um, this system. And, and so, um, you know, unlike other social services or schools where public officials have no qualms about making huge cuts and abrogating collective bargaining agreements, in this case, they often use police unions as an excuse to not make changes. And that's a really big problem. That's what Bill is pointing to as like so somewhat of the crux of the problem is that they're used as a smokescreen and an excuse. 
Now, the labor movement itself, um, you know, is is struggling over these issues, maybe not struggling as much as we would like, um, but there there have been calls from um, uh, folks within the labor movement uh, to expel or disaffiliate police unions from the AFL and from other um, major unions. Um, and, you know, I think the the reasons for that are very clear. These police unions and, and, and police advocacy is aligned with conservative white supremacists. Both the FOP and IUPA endorsed Trump. Um, and, you know, as Fletcher says, the labor movement does not actually have to accept all unions. It's not some kind of big tent umbrella where everyone is, is welcome. The labor movement is a movement of workers for justice and for a, a transformed society. We like to believe it's it's you know it's the right of the majority of the labor movement to distance ourselves from those who refuse to embrace the the values um, that that we stand for. But expelling police unions is not enough. It should uh, the labor movement needs to take a position regarding the overall role of law enforcement in a truly democratic society. So community control, as Femi was talking about, and, and abolition need to be oops, um, really discussed. And um, the um, other unions that are also uh, impl complicit in racist um, carceral systems and in racist institutions, all, you know, we also need to be talking and addressing uh, those, those contradictions. Now jumping into our local campaign, um, really quick version of this and we'll give you uh, references for more background. The DC FOP contract with the city expired on September 30th, but there's a rolling extension which can go on for quite a while. In the past, it's taken more than a year to bargain a new contract. Um, and certainly it's a, a tense uh, and, and contentious time now with you know, the budget being very strained and, uh, and the DC FOP just unsuccessfully sued the city over the emergency police reform bill that had some limits on discipline. They, they were unsuccessful, as, as, as I said, so uh, that might weaken them a little bit in the bargaining. Um, but we have um, looked at the, the collective bargaining agreement and um, worked with our coalition allies to put forward a set of demands um, that the CBA be taken as a real political statement of values, which is what it is, and that it needs to be changed so that officers are fired who violate civil rights, uh, that you know the city make officers personally liable um, when it's not above a certain threshold that would uh, be handled differently, uh, that they remove special treatment provisions for officers who engage in misconduct, uh, they stop the FOP from interfering in fair discipline processes, um, and they save the district money by um, having no raises and no uh, cost of living increases and revising the overtime threshold definition. You can tell we really got into the weeds of this uh, CBA and there are some real ways it could be reformed um, and the city could take that stand, the, the district could take that stand. stand. Um, and really these funds should instead be invested in violence prevention and non-carceral student support programs. Once the um, FOP and the city come to a tentative agreement, um, it goes to the Committee on Labor and Workforce Development, which is chaired by council member at large, Alyssa Silverman, who is relatively progressive. And, and she held a hearing last time around on this. And so a hearing is likely, we think. We've been meeting with some council members and haven't gotten any commitments yet on you know, our platform, um, our demands, but there has been good dialogue um, with some of them and uh, there's gonna be an escalating push as, you know, we don't know when this is coming, but we need to build consciousness and uh, public awareness, outrage, mobilization around around the, the issues here and how it ties into the defunding of MPD 
um, more broadly. So we think these, these things are very connected and need to be tied together. Uh, we hope to influence the committee before the vote so that, um, you know, it, it can get changed in the process. But once the contract is voted out of committee, it goes to the whole council and then to the mayor's desk for signature. Um, and uh, you can read our Washington Socialist article that has more details on this. So there's lots of ways to get involved. Um, we have a letter writing campaign. I think we've already generated nearly 1400 letters to the key decision makers in the city. Um, and you can sign and share that please. And coming right up, we have um, a walking tour on January 30th that I think Taylor is gonna jump in and say a few words about. But before you jump in Taylor, I'll just finish here, which is that you can also join the DSA um, MP, uh, defund working group by filling out this interest form and uh, become an organizational co-sponsor of the FOP campaign by emailing us and spreading the word. There's an explainer video that is very helpful and um, about police unions specifically that you can share around. So uh, Taylor, do you want to jump in and I'll share this uh, presentation in the chat. Are you there, Taylor? Can Taylor unmute or just one of us? Okay, I am going to empower you, Taylor. Um, let me see if I can, all right, I am empowering Taylor. I'm not asking to unmute. Let's see if that does anything. All right, you're unmuted, Taylor. Thanks so much, Chip. Um, as Nell said, the Defund MPD Working Group is hosting a walking tour um, next Saturday, January 30th at 1 p.m. And I'm here because you're invited. In terms of content and what you expect to see on at the walking tour, it's an in-person event that we see as a great complement to this session. Uh, Femi sort of Nell kind of gave you an overview of the system, um, police as political actors, and FOP in DC. What the tour will give you is local history through a visit to the front door of these <laughs> local police institutions, such as NPD headquarters, Fraternal Order of Police headquarters, um, National Museum for Law Enforcement, and more locations where volunteer tour guides will explain what these institutions are, where they came from, and why we need to defund them. And essentially just try to connect um, the space they're in, the buildings these people work in, to um, the policing institutions that are um, harming us in DC. Um, if this sounds interesting, please make sure to RSVP. Um, there's a link in the slides and I'll post it in the chat. Um, as you know, there's a strong military presence in DC. I think they're supposed to be out by then. And it's also end of January, so the weather might be volatile. And so even if you're not 100% sure, I encourage you to RSVP. Um, so that is the walking tour. Really excited about it. And um, thank you everyone for their time. Thanks, thank you, Taylor. And we also wanted to share from um, Femi and Stuart some great um, further reading recommendations here on this last slide. So I think that um, uh, a lot of these books were mentioned um, and you can read Stuart's book. Um, so, um, we'll leave that up there for a second, but, um, you can click through to it and I think we're good to move to questions, Chip. Yeah. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat box and I will read it to our panelists. I want to thank, you know, all three of you for your presentations and everyone who has attended. Uh, there was an earlier question about analytical Marxism and racial capitalism, but I believe it was resolved sufficiently in the chat box. So I am not going to return to that one. But our first question is from Tara and for Stuart. Uh, could you elaborate on some examples of how socialist leftist campaigns can exploit the difference between the liberal technocratic and rank and file police force approaches to police reforms? Yeah, that's a really good question. Certainly it gets to the, the crux of, of part of what I was talking about. Um, you know, I think that, that uh, you know, one one aspect is 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 certainly about um, 
thinking about who, who one's audience is. So, so if we think about what Nell was talking about with the, the FOP campaign um, in DC, um, these are not necessarily the liberal technocrats. So talking about some of the, the kind of um, technocratic reformism uh, might not uh, be the, the, the kind of issues that are gonna get any traction. Similarly, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, uh, imagine <laughs> you have an audience with the police chief, maybe you don't even want that audience, but talking about um, some of the things that have to do with the collective bargaining agreement, uh, again, might, the, the chief is not necessarily the person to, to address those two. I think more specifically, you know, again, thinking about the, the um, FOP campaign in, in DC, one thing that I, I kind of took away from this presentation that, that goes, uh, you know, along these lines um, is, it is pressing on what should be bargainable and what shouldn't be bargainable. Basically, what we've seen over the history of police union, uh, the police union movement, which really um, took off in the 1960s, is just an <clears throat> increasing array of topics and, and issues that, that have become bargainable. So really, you know, the kind of like bread and butter wages issues that were um, where it started, <laughs> it's clearly not where we're at today. Um, and it's lots of these kind of protections for police officers and whatever. Um, but then the question becomes like, you know, how, how, how might it be possible to, to rein some of that in? Where, where does the pressure need to be placed? Does it need to be placed at the state level? Um, obviously that's not uh, question in DC, um, but in other places, does it need to be um, focused on the police, on legislatures? Basically, my point is, um, I think, as as Mel demonstrated really wonderfully, really in intensive research on um, the kind of power structure, how some of these things connect, and who these different factions are is going to be necessary in different places, different um, situations, um, because ultimately, the, uh, the, the, the different um, actors within police institutions might actually not see eye to eye on this. And um, there might be, you know, unexpected convergences between demands. I, I actually um, would not be surprised to learn, for example, that um, some police chiefs would, would like to have greater disciplinary power over police that they currently do not have because of either state law or things in the collective bargaining agreements. Um, and, and those might actually be uh, things that could be addressed, you know, relatively in a straightforward fashion, building on the energy of social protests that we've seen over 20, over the year of 2020. Um, Nell, you're still sharing your screen. Yeah, I don't know if you all wanted us to read your email with you. Um. Ah, thank you. I, yeah. I was d double checking that the FOP was founded 100 years ago. It was. Excellent, excellent. Um, so our next question is from Benjamin. I've got a question he starts with. We see tons of examples of self-proclaimed progressives, mayors, who are constantly beholden to the police. As much as some of us would like to view this is just being mayors being weak neoliberal politicians. Can any of you say more about what this says about the political power of police, which appears to exceed that of their supposed managers, i.e. mayors, and what we might do about this? This is an excellent question, Benjamin. Uh, anyone can answer the question. It's for all of you. Don't all answer at once, though. So just real quick, um, I think, you know, one thing will that comes, I think, pretty close on the heels of the way that um, Stuart's advising us to think about these things, which I think is how we should think about these things. You know, we have to get comfortable making a distinction between like formal power or de jure power, or, you know legal power and uh, de facto power, like who can actually make shit happen. Um, and I think, you know, there's a political 
tradition. There's like a, a realist tradition or, you know, I mean, the kind of shit that Mao said, where it's just like, it's unsurprising that the people holding the guns are at the end of the day, the people actually calling the shots, right? Um, what that means in terms of uh, oversight in the way that um, policing has developed in recent decades, both institutionally in terms of police unions, um, but I think very, like very generally, like across violence work. So um, CBP, ICE, um, as we saw kind of flashes of as they became de facto federal police during the summer protests. Like we're, we're dealing with rogue institutions. Um, and I think that's exploitable um, to some extent, right? It just, it just in the way, you know, Stuart was kind of explaining, you know, chiefs of police might want to have more legal formal powers for discipline of their workers than they currently have. I think mayors um, and governors and um, city councils might like to have more formal power over their police departments than they currently have. Obviously not across the board, but I think you know, there's an exploitable fact there of the kind of strong arm tactics that a lot of policing um, state violence work organizations have been engaged in the past few decades. I'm not quite sure what to do about that, but we should, it's worth thinking about. Maybe just one, one other thing that I would just mention briefly um, is that in maybe an optimistic fashion, I think people who, you know, th those of you who are on this call, like we, we, we should actually think of ourselves as being in a pretty strong position right now. Um, 2020 did change um, a lot of, of, uh, of these dynamics and um, police are, are, are on their heels and, and they're, they're, they, they, you know, they have a certain feeling of being under siege, being aggrieved. Obviously, this intersects with um, Trumpism as an ideology. Um, but, but I, I think I think that we, you know, we on the left can can use that to our advantage. Um, I think that some of the behaviors of police uh, in the political realm, like doxing their opponents um, going after them on Twitter. Like these are not, <laughs> these are not examples of their political strength. These are examples of their political weakness. Um, and and, it, and it's, it's, it's not a surprise that you start seeing, you know, cops using Twitter to dox their political enemies at the moment when their, their allies and state legislatures are losing elections, you know, dying because they're 110 years old or whatever, right? So like, I think um, we, we, it would behoove the the, the left to um, to 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 um, act as if we we were were the momentum and the the wind is in our sails, you know, because um, I think that actually is the case, and and um, and 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 recognize that that cops are are embattled, and and again, you know, the, the the report I mentioned that came out from the Trump administration, you know, they spent a year producing this report, and it. It disappeared without a trace. I think that that's actually a good thing. You know, I wanted to write something about it. Then I was like, you know what? It's better that nobody even knows that this thing happened because um, it's it's irrelevant, right? Like th that position is 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 it evaporated. Um, so let's just move on and keep up the fight and keep saying defund the police and not respond to their um, you know their claims that you know defund is bad, blah blah blah. And here's a hundred page report about why it's bad. Forget it. Let's just keep 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 our eye on the ball. Uh, thank you for that answer. Nell, do you have anything you want to add or? No, I, I, we could move on to the next one. The next question is for you explicitly, Nell. So um, have you looked at ways to require public notification and consultation and collective bargaining process? Also, have you looked into changing the arbitration process for police? And before Nell answers that, I want to remind everyone, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box and I will read it to the presenters. Did we, did you also flag the question before that trip from Joanna? Cause I think it, it also gets at the DC specific situation. Oh, I missed that one. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I will ask that one next. 
Um, okay, well, um, on I'll the back, yeah, on the on Williams' question, um, we basically the answer is I don't know. Um, I think you know we are through this process of the campaign, kind of learning what um, what we could what the current process is. So I think that's a good opportunity to ask for more public input. Um, and, to, and that's what we're trying to achieve is to get more public involvement and, and oversight. Um, but as far as we know, like as far as I know, we don't have specific tactics to achieve that or specific demands on that right now. Um, and the arbitration process, um, you know, I, I, again, my, the answer is I don't know, but I think that the the it would be probably a useful um, reference point to look at the emergency police reform um, legislation and what the lawsuit was over. And that gives you a little bit of an idea of how um, the there's an effort to take some disciplinary power away from um, the union process, you know, which is not to say that there, there won't still be a union process, but that, um, that there will be less uh, discretion and more more uh, um, district level oversight rather than it being just controlled by the police department. Um, so I think that will definitely implicate the arbitration process as part of that, but um, I can't really provide a more complete answer. If anyone else who's on the campaign like Ben or, or anyone who's done more research into this wants to raise your hand and get off mute, um, you can feel free. see any hands raised to get off mute otherwise I would I would call upon them so the question I skipped over and I apologize again was last year the defense for not further defunding the NPD was because CFO couldn't certify cuts presumably all of that was tied to contract stuff but are there laws on the book that do, do that in DC that require a certain staffing level for police or would that prevent firing or downsizing? Or is this all only tied to contract issues? Also, if it's all contract related, can you say more about what exactly would need to be changed in contract to allow for large scale downsizing, including for police being let go without just cause, like they don't have discipline issues or just need or want to cut force sizes? Yeah, well, I feel pretty confident answering this, though, again, like, acknowledging that I'm an activist, not a not a expert, um, specifically on this, but has someone who understands like the way that union bargaining operates and, and management um, prerogative, the, the city, the district actually has a lot of authority to, to lay off work um, police officers. There's nothing in the contract that specifically states what the staffing levels should be. Um, that is a management prerogative. Um, and usually in any kind of union contract, there's a kind of needs of the business um, provision and clause that says like, if, you know, if, if the um, employer needs to cut the size of the workforce, that's their that's their prerogative. They can then bargain over the impacts of that on workers, but not on the decision. Um, so what we've been developing with the coalition's leadership, um, especially BLMDC, is a vision statement for the defunding goals. And that's going to be released soon. But just as a quick preview of it, there's a goal um, to cut the MPD budget by 50% over three years. I mean, that's what we're really in practical terms going to be pushing for. And um, that involves definitely significantly cutting the police force. So we're doing research now on things like um, the attrition rate. So if you just didn't fill um, vacancies, how quickly would the force shrink? Um, you know, what, um, how would you cut the patrol forces, various areas that are bloated, the overtime, obviously, but um, but yeah, we're, we're looking at how you practically achieve this right now. So if you want to get involved in that, definitely, um, just fill out the interest form to, to learn more about the campaign and, and we're working through those exact issues of how to shrink the force right now, but we believe it's, it's eminently practical. Excellent. 
And if anyone else has questions, could you please put them in the chat box? I don't see any currently open questions. If I've missed your question, I apologize. If you could reshare it, I will read it. I'm also going back and I don't see any questions. Uh, the form is in the chat box. If you have a question, uh, other than is my name short for something, please, please put it in, in the chat box. That is the only open question we have at the moment. If if I could just maybe add add on to what what Nels said I, I, in in reference to the last question, um, I, it's this this is also true in in other cities um, that these the size of the police force is not necessarily something that the contract stipulates. It's decided through other means. Um, but one thing that was interesting in, in, in Baltimore when the, the, the you know, demand for defunding the police came last spring, um, right, right when the city council was in the process of um, you know, determining what the budget was, you know, Baltimore is, is under a consent decree right now with the DOJ for um, you know, the abuses that the, the um, Obama DOJ found in, in 2015. And uh, Baltimore City said, well, we, we, we can't you know, defund or cut because we have to fulfill our obligations in the consent decree, which you know, is, is, is um, monitored by a judge. And what struck me about that was, was that you know, the, the Trump administration was not actually upholding its end of the consent decree, um, but, but, but Baltimore City was kind of hiding behind the consent decree as a, as a justification for not um, making any cuts. Um, so I think, you know, we, it would be useful in those types of situations to, to have, you know, arguments to, to put forth as to why those aren't, aren't real good justifications. And then in the end, when, when BPD did, did decide to make some cuts, what did they cut? They cut the equestrian unit and the, uh, boat unit in the Harbor, obviously the last units that are likely to, you know, um, s stop and frisk somebody and violate their constitutional rights are the equestrian unit and the um, and, and the boat unit, right? So, and then in the end, they, the, the equestrian unit cut, it, it didn't even really happen um, for, for complicated reasons. So this is another thing that's like, um, you know, obviously I'm 100% behind the, the, the demand to defund the police. Um, but then when the response is, okay, we're gonna defund the horses, I would say, no, no, keep the horses, Get get rid of other units that are, you know, on the ground, played plain cozy unit, you know, the ones that are most responsible for the abuses. Absolutely, that's where the the cuts need to be made, and we need to just be extremely explicit about that. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and then, do we have any questions? Anyone have a question? Um, okay, for Femi and Stuart. I'm really struck by the idea that police are producers of the social stratifications of racial capitalism, not just its protectors. And I'm curious if there are similar institutions that are commonly thought of as protectors of the status quo, but are actually reproducing it. That's from Benjamin. I can tell it's a good question because I can see you both thinking. Um, Oh. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a really good question. Um, so along the, I mean, along the lines of uh, maybe the best example I can think of um, is urban planning, um, and and planning like really broadly construed. So, so, you know, in a big city, there might be, you know, dedicated planners in a smaller city. It might be something that city council kind of takes on. Um, but you think about things like, you know, zoning commissions and shit. Um, and I think there's a way of thinking about what those institutions are that is very kind of bloodless and technocratic. Um, but then you look at the kind of consequences, the distributive consequences, the racial consequences of those decisions, and you start to realize, oh, like actually in very powerful ways, these questions are just 
the direct answer of the government to who gets what, who gets housing, who's insecure, who's secure um, in various kinds of senses. So I think um, whoever is doing the planning, um, the city planning um, is uh, a person that, you know, you might think of that people might commonly think of as just kind of protecting the status quo, but is actually um, really powerfully intervening in distrib distributive questions and um, as a result, racial realities. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And I think, um, you know, once, once, once you look at, 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 at cities, you know, and you kind of like scale up, like from say, say like, you know, an individual residence to a neighborhood, you know, to, to the city, it's like, um, planning is, is a good way to think about how, how all of this is integrated, but like all of the institutions, um, the, the real estate agent, um, the school board, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, sewer company or, you know, whatever. So, like all of these, we, we tend to think of them as like basically neutral. Um, their job is just to like get services. You know, you want, when you flush the toilet, you want the waste to go away. Um, but actually the, these are all um, producing all kinds of um, environmental harms and allocate and there's allocations and distributions of where harms are um, you know where inequalities are are located what the boundaries are between um, the well-off neighborhood and the less well-off neighborhood um, why don't how housing prices rise on one side of this the, the, the street and why do they rise on the other side of the street you know um, on the one hand I, 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 I'm wary of, 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 of attributing, um, you know, conscious intent to every single actor in this chain. But on the other hand, I think we, when we look in the aggregate, we can see how um, all of these different actors play a role in, in these, you know, invidious racial consequences uh, of inequality um, and, and, and um, group differentiated vulnerability to premature death in Ruth Wilson Gilmore's terms. Um, we tend to think that police are the, the main ones. And this kind of goes back to the thing I said at the beginning, even though I'm talking about police, I, you know, that's what I, I do my work about. Um, I think we need to think about this, this kind of broader um, institutional uh, fabric and, and, and absolutely planning is, is a central node in it. Those are excellent points. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? That was a really great question. Those are really, really great answers. This has been a very informative evening. Um, I'm gonna give a couple more opportunities for people to ask um, some questions. And then if not, I will let our panelists get on with their evening. Um, going once, we have 20 more minutes for questions, but if no one has one, I will, I will let people do. Other things. Okay. Uh, do any of you have any final thoughts you want to share with with the audience? And if there's any last questions, I'll then read them then. But this is the last call for questions. Let's we'll start with Nell since since she went last. We can go reverse order. So Nell, Stuart, Femi. Um, I would just make a final pitch for getting involved in the campaign. Um, you know, I think it's been a very, um, I guess, energizing, if that's the right word, to feel like in this moment of like a national uprising, um, there is a way through DSA to plug in and be helpful, um, no matter kind of what your experience or skills or interests or risk level is. Uh, there's just lots of different things to do. We have um, a research sub team, we have an action turnout sub team, we've got um, our internal organizing to, to, to get people engaged. Um, uh, we have political education that partnered on this and um, communication. So there's all kinds of ways to get involved and we meet monthly. Um, so 
Uh, that info is is on the DSA website, but the best way to get involved is that um, is that interest form link that Runal shared uh, again a little bit ago. And uh, feel free to reach out to to me as well. I'll drop my email in the in the chat. But it's been very cool, especially on the FOP campaign. The coalition has really appreciated DSA's involvement since we have a specific labor orientation in our outlook and our work. So we've been able to really contribute and build deeper relationships with the other coalition partners, BLMDC, um, BYP 100, Black Swan Academy, and um, Stop Police Terror Project are the founding members, but there's a lot of groups involved now. Um, so um, there's a ton coming up in the next few months with the budget fight, and uh, we'll definitely be reaching out to the entire chapter to get involved. So that's what I would that's what I would wrap up with. And thanks, uh, Renal, for um, also putting the general email in there. And I also put information about the night school in the chat as well, and the um, sign up form for to fund the MPDs in there as well. Uh, Stuart. Um, no, nothing more of substance to add. Just thanks very much for this opportunity to, to speak with you. And um, I'm, I'm uh, definitely following following the the campaign, and and I, I wish everybody the best of of luck with with your work going forward. And certainly, if if I can be of further um, help or assistance, please um, everybody feel free to to get in touch, um, and I'd, I'd be happy to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, Stuart. We really appreciate it. And and Femi. Yeah, just um, thanks to everybody for coming out. Um, and good luck going forward. I hope everybody gets involved with, if not defund MPD, um, any of the other numbers of things that um, DSA is up to, because as we kind of circled around to at the end, you know, all this fits together. And that's the point of thinking theoretically about capitalism or racial capital or whatever else. So, you know, whatever it moves you to get involved with, please do. Thank you to all of our presenters and everyone who attended. Um, the next scheduled night school session is on February 22nd. It's Sarah Jaffe talking about her new book. Although we hope we will have another night school session or maybe two before then. Uh, David and I are working very hard to try to get some sessions scheduled on the Haitian Revolution, Franz Fanon, Black Panther Party, and, and Eugene Debs, but they're still very much in the works and not uh, at all settled yet, but hopefully uh, the next time I see you will be for one of those. And if not, it'll be for Sarah Jaffe, who is getting a lot of love in the chat. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for doing this. And uh, thank you, Stephanie, as always, for handling the back end of these uh, socialist night schools. I don't think that we've ever given you credit publicly for that yet, and we should have done so.